Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Okay, so we're going to be going over. Let's wait for some peoples to get on here. Again, those of you who are watching on the YouTube live later, um, if you're watching on YouTube, I'm sorry, the video, then it'll be about 10 minutes into this, 12 minutes actually today. Shalom, shalom. We're going to be going through the book of John. Okay, everyone. There's going to be a lot of good stuff. A lot of good stuff today. Shalom, shalom. Hi, Heather. Hi, Everly. Hello, hello, hello. How's it going? Do you guys still have snow up there at the base of the mountain? We, um, we didn't get snow the other day. We just got rain. Sorry, my hair's a little wild because I slipped on it wet. <laughs> so I'm trying to like calm it down. <laughs> oh, anyway, shalom, shalom, shalom. How is everyone? Hello. Hi, Gary. We're going to be going through the book, the story of Passover today. That was the unan almost unanimous vote. Um, <laughs> Um, so we're going to be going through the book of John and the story of Passover today. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Heather. Right. No, it's a little crazy. <laughs> oh. But <clears throat> we're going to be going through the story of the Passover today. So we're going to have a lot of chapters to cover in the book of John. We're going to start in 11 minutes. Shalom, Linda. And this is getting exciting. It's the story of... Isn't it neat when the Bible comes alive and you understand that the story of Passover like, is literally what Yeshua did? <laughs> it wasn't just some arbitrary event. You know, like, you know what I mean? Like the pagan holidays, like bunnies and fat men in red suits and stuff. It's like, what? But when you start looking at these biblical feasts, isn't that beautiful? Hi, Jenny. Shalom, shalom, Shabbat shalom, everybody. I'm so thankful for all of you. Shalom, Christina. Shalom, shalom, shalom. There was almost a unanimous vote to go through the book of John. <laughs> Only two people said Leviticus, and everybody else came back with, um, Hi, Dale. Shabbat Shalom. How is your new place, by the way, Dale? Are you liking it? Hi, Cassandra. Cassandra. There's probably a Cassandra and a Cassandra. Um, hi, hi, Laura. Oh, my gosh. You guys melt my heart. My heart just started melting. Like I feel like the mama's heart, you know, when your kids come home. <laughs> and you get to see all your kids. I don't know. When you, especially when your kids are grown up. You'll understand that. Like, Laura knows that feeling. Like, when they're gone, and Jenny knows that feeling. Some of you, I don't know how old your children are. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom, Angela. Angela knows that feeling. Hello, Cassandra. When your kiddos come home and they haven't been there. Hi, Charlene. Oh, I love you. Would everybody say just, I'm not going to say what the prayer request is. Would you please just keep our sister Charlene in prayer? She just needs deliverance and protection and help. So if anybody could just keep her in prayer. Our friend Charlene really needs it. Um, hi, Cassandra. Shabbat shalom. Yes, we're going to be going through the book of John today. I like to start in the chapter 11. 11. 11. It's, then we go through like um, whatever it is to the end. So we're going to read a lot today. Uh, I know. Isn't it such a warm? And like, yeah, it's, it's like when you see your grown-up children, there's a whole different kind of like, oh, <laughs> right? Because they're gone. And then, I don't know. It's just like a different... A little different mama's heart. Heather knows this too because, well, now she really knows it. Um, but because um, Savannah is probably far away and like that's like such a long way. I guess Savannah was kind of a long way away anyway. Anybody have a praise report? Anybody have a prayer request while we're waiting here? Because we have about nine minutes till we're going to start the teaching. So those of you who watch this later, feel free to fast forward past this intro for nine minutes. Um, I have it. Oh. <laughs> Oh, that's interesting. See, and I don't even read the comments on Zoom, Linda. <laughs> like, I'll like realize people, hi Donna, I'll realize people are over here typing and I'm like, I don't look, because I'm, I'm very focused, like I'm very present. <laughs> so when I ignore my phone, it's because I'm doing something else. <laughs> hi guys, hi Connie, shalom, shalom. You, there you go, okay. Um, yes, I get it. But see, the marshmallows have to be burned. That's the only way I can eat marshmallows, Laura. <laughs> oh, that's awesome, Justin. I bet it feels so good. Uh, I'm believing God that he heals my thyroid. Yes. Oh, I felt such intense power last night when we were praying for Hannah. I don't know, but my hands were just like on 
fire. So we're going to pray. Let's pray for Linda. <clears throat> Hi, Tracy. Father God, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we bring before you your daughter, Linda, Lord. You are you're the one who formed her in the womb. You knit her together through the words spoken. You spoke us into being. You created everything, Lord. Nothing is too hard for you. And we lift up our sister, Linda, right now, Lord. We ask, Lord, for forgiveness for the seeking of man and for not knowing what to do. But, Father God, please intervene right now mightily on behalf of your servant that you would heal her body completely and restore her because you are the God who heals. And Yahweh Elohim, we thank you that in your stripes, Yeshua, we are healed. We thank you that you laid down a, your life for us, Father God. And we understand that mostly that means, I get it, it's about our sins as well as um, as other things. But, Lord, we know, we know you're the God who heals. And reach down right now and heal physically, spiritually, in every way, Lord. Thank you. In the mighty name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen. And just so you know, Yeshua is God. There's been a lot of people arguing with me on Instagram and Facebook lately trying to convince me that Yeshua is not deity. And I'm like, no, I read the Hebrew text. The word Elohim is plural. It says, let us make man in our image. Hi, Jesse. Hi, Atlas. Hi, Mavis. Um, hi, Jody. So there's a lot of people going around with weird theories. Oh, I swear I missed you last night. That's okay. Well, I'm, um, I'm glad you got to study the word. And last night ended up being a little bit more of an intervention, not exactly what I was expecting. Um, and so it, that's okay. I thought we were going to get in the word more, but it's okay. It was the word working to help deliver someone that's been needing help for a long time. But the father told me to wear this today. <laughs> it's my little, this came from Israel. Um, my husband got it when we looked, he went to the Dead Sea Scroll exhibit for me. And so the Lord said, bear the children upon your heart today. So these are the, for the children, represent the children of Israel. I don't know if you can see all the different colors in there, the jewels, the little jewels from Israel. Um, um, oh, I know. I felt it, Linda. I did. I felt the power in my hands. Oh, <gasps> Father God, please heal Gil's foot. Please help him to understand if there's any, any way in which he's walking incorrectly. But Father, right now for your mighty glory, reach down, heal him physically, spiritually, in every way. Lord, please for your glory. In the name of Yeshua, amen. Um, awesome. Shalom, shalom, shalom. Shalikina. Yeah. So guys, we're going to start in five more minutes. Um, we do need to say a special prayer request. There's somebody who's blatantly disobeying Sabbath today. And I'm just praying that Yahweh makes, helps him to understand Yahweh's truth. I don't pray judgment on anybody. We don't pray weird things on people. We just say, Father, um, would you please would you please open this person's heart? Make it very clear what he's supposed to be doing today. Um, yes, yes, Angela. Let me get it kind of closer here. Um, you guys, and it's very important with our prayers that we never pray witchcraft on people. Make sure that when you pray for somebody, even if they're against you or disagree with you or whatever, you pray life over them and you pray that they would only see the heart and the truth of God. Don't ever pray judgment on somebody. That's not okay. That's not okay. That's not okay. What we pray is we say, Father God, open their eyes to your truth, not my truth, because we, what if we're wrong? <laughs> what if we're wrong, right? We have to be able to be truth seekers. Um, let me show you this, Angela. Oh, uh, did it? Here, how do I get it to focus there? I don't know, but you can maybe see it. It's kind of pretty, huh? Well, it's really pretty, not just kind of. Shabbat Shalom. Oh, good day. Praise Yahweh. There's our sister, Danielle. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Um, and so, hi, Ever Ann. Shabbat Shalom, sweetie. Guys, we're going to be going through the book of John today. It was like almost a unanimous vote. There was only one or two people who said Luke, <laughs> or I mean Leviticus, um, and I didn't get the poll out there to everybody, but I got it out there to quite a few people. I was just like, boom, 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 boom. Um, hi, Stephanie. Shalom, shalom. Isn't that fun? And, and so when I wear it, I just know to be lifting up the children of Israel. Um, yes. Ooh. Um, very near to go. Okay. Oh. Okay. Yeah, Elohim, we lift up our sister, Laura. And even if, what if this is just a test, Lord? Just a test of your, and to show your faithfulness and your glory and the way you work through these situations. Father God, will you hold your daughter up? Would you heal her? Would you sustain her? Would you deliver her mightily, Father? Please heal her arm. Please heal her shoulder. Everything that's having pain right now, Father, would you show her if there is a root cause of this spiritually and physically? Would you heal her, Lord? Because in your stripes we are healed. Lord, you say it. You said it. You said you're our healer. And thank you, Lord, that you do discipline us and offer us these corrections. Thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you, thank you, thank you. In the name of Yeshua, amen. One of the things I'm going to make a reel on soon and that I was reading this morning, Shalom, Shalom, Anais, um, 
is in Lamentations. It talks about the false prophets. And in Lamentations 2.15, we already know the false prophets speak against the Torah, right? Against the Word of God. That's in Deuteronomy 13. <clears throat> One of the things that we need to also look at is in Lamentations 2.15, it says the false prophets do not turn the people from their errors and their sinful ways. And of course, we understand that in modern church systems and People just get coddled. They're not told what to repent from. They're told it's okay to eat their bacon. They're told it's okay to break the Sabbath. They're told it's okay to continue in their sins. So a true prophet of Yahweh, hello, Terenda, a true, I hope, a true prophet of God will not be <laughs> the one you always want to show up at your doorstep. But if you're humble, you will. You'll want to see that person because the person's coming to help you get better and closer to God so that you can eternally inherit the best blessing ever, right? And so a true prophet of God helps you to turn and overcome your sin. A true prophet of God is sent to you to turn you from sin and disobedience. And so remember, when people come to you and we say things that are hard, that's the person who loves you because that person cares about your soul. But a false prophet just cares about the money you pay them and then they want you to make, they want you to, they want, they want you to accolade them. They want you to think they're a good person. But it's, like a true prophet of God doesn't do that. They, they just literally work for Yahweh's glory and your salvation and your soul. And so, um, awesome, sweetie. So when somebody comes to you and gently says, hey, this is something I think you need to work on, or I see this, accept that person, accept that person. Um, and even what I've done, even if somebody's wrong, I've had a lot of false, I woke up this morning and the first words the Lord led me to in the scripture was false witnesses have risen against me. And you all know I have plenty of those. <laughs> But you know what I do when a false witness comes to me? I say, Father, is there any truth in this? Please make me a better person because even the words of the enemy can be used for my good if it turns me to righteousness, <laughs> right? So what was meant to condemn me can be used to make me better because if I don't see something, even if it's from somebody who absolutely hates me and abhors me, um, Father, just help me to see any truth in my behavior that I need to change, right? And if there is any truth that I'm not, seen then open my eyes and so satan can't win then like he's not going to condemn me because you don't have anything over me so when you're praying like i get told all the time in judgment like you know yeah i hope god opened your eyes and i'm like yep me too <laughs> praise god yes and that's how we all need to behave and so then when somebody does come to us truly when we're doing something like hey i think you you know need to be aware of this it's like okay thank you i'll take it to the father um i'll, I'll answer to him well he, he'll show me praise god um um, he has to do mm. Oh, right. And so we, okay, we never have to work. I'm a farmer as well. We never have to work, but we do make choices. And what, um, what, there's a famous saying out there that says, you will do what's important to you. So what we're going to pray is that Father makes a way, Cassandra, for your husband to have in his heart because he'll, he'll make a way. <laughs> if, there, if there's something important that we want to do, we will make a way to do it. We all know that, right? We'll bust our butts, get the extra work done on Friday. We'll do this. We'll do that. And so you will do what's important to you. And so those people who say they love their families, but they're always on their phone, they're showing what's important. They're showing that their phone is more important. The people who say they love God but disobey his commandments, they're showing what's important, that they choose their own way over God's ways. And so remember that. Whenever we do something, our, we will do what's important to us. And so we always have a choice. We always have a choice. There is always a choice. Um, and so I do pray, Father God, please show Cassandra's husband how... Um, how to maneuver through this, how to put you first, how to make it so that he can have today off. Father God, please work mightily in his life and give him that zealous heart, Father God, that just loves you and get him out of that industry anyway, Father God, as we understand that it's not of you, that not the farming, just this particular so that I know the situation. Yeah, I thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you. In the name of Yeshua, we pray for that. Amen. Okay, guys, we are two minutes past when we we're going to start. So let's go ahead and start. And let's... Um, Let's go ahead and open with prayer. I'm going to, yeah, just do some kneeling today. Um, and I didn't, I didn't, I didn't post a lot of the schedule this week. So I want, some people might be um, not aware that we're live and that's okay. But Yahweh, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we come before your throne. We worship you. We adore you. We praise you for your holy name. We praise you for your Sabbath, for this time to meet with you. We praise you for your son. We thank you for the provision that we have shelter, clothing, and food. We ask, Lord, for help for provision for those who need it. We ask, Lord, for healing for those who need it. In the mighty name of Yeshua, through the power and the stripes of you that were shed to heal. 
We ask Yahweh Elohim that you would come and teach us today, anoint this study, open our eyes, ears, and hearts to your truth, and lead us only in your wisdom and truth. We reveal almighty wonders and beautiful things in your word, and we love you so much, Father. We bless your name, and we praise you. Please come now and take control. In the name of Yeshua, we ask, amen. Okay, kiddos. Now, we're going to be going through the book of John today. It was almost unanimous. There was only, oh, yeah. Okay. And Father, we do lift up Kathy's husband. Father, silence the words of the enemies that came from that ex-pastor and just let your truth, your truth, your truth come through. Let the word of God open his eyes, ears, and hearts to comprehend. And we bind and rebuke those demons of oh, any false spirit. In the name of Yeshua, amen. And remember that Lamentations 2 says that the false prophets do not turn the people from their errors, right? The people who speak the Torah are the true prophets. Now, Remember, Judaism wasn't Torah. They were doing the Talmud, so that's why they got in trouble. So Jews, Judaism, Jews added to the law. Um, Babylonian Christians took away from the law, right? We don't want to do either one. Hi, Katie. Hi, Graciela. Yay, Lisa. Shalom, shalom. Hi, Tristan. Okay, so we need to remember that. Um, the, so you, and maybe, Kathy, those are some things you can go through with your husband and say, look, this pastor, did he turn you from your sin and unrighteousness, or did he make you feel okay sitting where you're at. And that, it says, your prophets like just let you sit where you are. They say, peace, peace, where there is no peace. Okay, so people voted, or some people, I sent out a quick message to a whole bunch of people, um, just as the names popped up, and we voted on the book of John. We're going to go through the story of Passover today, because a lot of people are getting confused by the book of Matthew. Now, I wanted to point out, the book of Matthew has over 2,000 Greek manuscripts that are all different. I'm not saying to throw it out. I'm saying when you see that the translators who were English people, well, Europeans, who did not understand the Torah, were translated, and they try to say Yeshua ate the Passover in his room, just like the Book of Mark, like all these different texts, it's because they didn't understand. And the translators were struggling to put into words what was being said, so they said he ate the Passover. Well, that would have been a sin. So if you knew the Book of Ed, because I hear some people argue, but Yeshua ate it, it says right here. Well, what about the book of Exodus that already said if you eat, like Deuteronomy says, if you eat it in your homes, you're gonna, you're sinning. Like, come on. You know what I mean? There's this, this, this illogic. It's like a, sometimes dealing with somebody of a, who can't understand comprehension of reading. It's like, you have to understand like what was happening. These texts were being translated by people who didn't understand, understand the Torah. And so the book of John got it just right. The timeline matches with that in Exodus and Deuteronomy. And we know it's correct because it goes by the Torah. Everything is supposed to be compared to the Torah, correct? Okay, so. Um, awesome, Kimberly. I'm glad you made it, sweetie. Okay, now let's, we're gonna begin in the book of John because this talks about <coughs> we're going through the timeline of the Passover, and I want to remind you from the story of Exodus in, in the Passover. In the month of Abib, that word Abib it means a specific stage of barley ripeness. When they saw the fields, not just for two or three people, but enough for the entire nation to bring the first of that pro, the first of the Abib harvest to the temple, then they knew, or the tabernacle, then they knew, oh, this is the beginning of the year. That's why they named the first month. Abib, because <laughs> it literally is the Hebrew word that means that. So when you see, hello, Diane, when you see barley in the stage of Abib, you're like, oh, yay. And it's not just a little bit, because it says everyone from the children of Israel must bring the first fruits of their barley to the place where Yahweh put his name. Now, that on the first day of Abib, that would happen then when we saw the visible new moon sighting. After, as soon as we saw the Abib, we, what, we look for the new moon, and then when we see it, we would blow the shofar of the trumpet and say, okay, it's the new year and the new month. On the 10th day of that month, which of course the, the days begin at sunset. Okay, the days begin at sunset. Oh, hi, Shelly. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so Abib, they find the Abib and they make it to, um, blah, blah, blah. okay, they find the Abib. They say this is the beginning of the year. The children of Israel could bring the first of their harvest to the, t the place where Yahweh puts his name. They could offer up the first of their first fruits to Yahweh. Then that new moon, the visible new moon sighting begins that month. The father worked with shepherds and agricultural, very simple people. You don't have to go off some weird conjunctions. He did not make anything confusing like man tried to make it. He, hi, Nikki. <clears throat> he wanted us to be able to understand, and he put the signs right for us to see, right there for us to see, <laughs> right? And so 
we would count to the tenth day. At the at the at the tenth day, remember the day begins at sunset on even uh, at the evening of the day, right? That just was convoluted. At sunset, the day begins. So on the tenth day, the children of Israel, when they were in the first Exodus and in the wilderness, they would take a lamb into their home. And if they were a small family, they would share it with their neighbors, of course. And they would inspect that lamb for four days. And then at the end of the 14th day, which was the day of Passover, it is not a no work Sabbath. It is not a, it's a high yearly Sabbath of commemoration. It's not a no work day. And at the end of that day, they would slaughter the Passover lamb. As the 15th day was beginning, then that meat that was roasting would be eaten with the unleavened bread and bitter herbs. And then that night at the middle of the night, midnight doesn't mean 12 in the Bible. <laughs> midnight just means the middle of the night, middle of the night, midnight. They then fled Egypt with their kneading bowls and, and they left in haste and their bread did not rise if you make sourdough bread. So that's the timeline that happened. Now the book of Matthew, again, has over 2,000 manuscripts. They're all different and here's in, in Mark the same thing. Um, <clears throat> I don't know that Mark had 2,000, but there were, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm drinking milk and it's making my phlegm. <clears throat> The book of Mark as well tries to indicate that Yeshua was eating the Passover lamb. But the book of John tells us, so we already told in Deuteronomy 16, you can't eat the Passover in your gates. We already know it's a sacrifice. Exodus 12 says it twice. And sacrifices could only be done in the tabernacle or the temple, right? At the place where Yahweh put his name. And the book of Matthew and Mark do get people confused on the timeline. But let's remember the original Exodus prophetic timeline. And then let's remember that we are told that there's going to be a communal one coming. And Leviticus 17 says, once you have the place where God put his name, don't you dare sacrifice in your own gates anywhere. Because then he says it's sacrificing to goat demons. If you look in the Hebrew there, it says goat demons. And then in Deuteronomy 16, he reiterates, don't you dare sacrifice the Passover in your own gates. Don't you dare sacrifice the Passover in your own gates. Okay, now that's the premise for what we're looking at. The book of John exactly shows that exact timeline. I'm going to state it and then we're going to read it. Yeshua came into Jerusalem 10, I'm sorry, on the 10th day of Abib. He rode in on a little donkey, Hakamor, <laughs> Hakatan. You remember the little Hebrew song we do? Yeshua came in to Jerusalem and he was inspected in the temple by the Pharisees and Sadducees for four days and no blemish was found in him but according to them they found fault but the true believers and hearers knew there was no no fault in him on that Tuesday night as the 14th day of Abi began he had a dinner in his home with his servants called the Last Supper it was his final supper it wasn't the Passover and we'll prove that in the next, it will prove that in the book of John here. <clears throat> so they had supper. He washed their feet. He broke bread, drank wine, go out to the garden. He's praying and he's arrested. He's brought the next morning into the praetorium, it says. And the next morning on that begin, the middle of the 14th day now, right? Because the day starts at sunset. And on the 14th of Abib, he's brought into the praetorium. And it says the Jews would not enter the praetorium because they did not want to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover that night. Well, that matches the timeline because you don't eat the Passover at the beginning of the 14th of Abib. You eat it at the end of the 14th of Abib as the 15th of Abib is beginning because that begins the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Yeshua is literally crucified at the Moed, the appointed time, exactly when the Passover lamb was being killed. Yeshua died. At the same time, those in the Jews were sacrificing the Passover lambs because that morning when he was being interrogated, it said they hadn't yet done the Passover, which that's biblical, that's accurate. And they wouldn't go into the praetorium because they didn't want to be defiled because they had already been cleansed so that they couldn't go in to the temple that night, right? Because you had to go to the temple to eat the Passover. You literally had to be cleansed. Second Chronicles 30, the whole story of Hezekiah shows when you aren't mikvah, when you aren't baptized before you eat the Passover, you get sick. And so Hezekiah had to, had to intervene for the people because they didn't purify themselves. Well, you don't have to be purified for your own home. You had to be purified for the temple, okay? And so Yeshua ate, did not eat the Passover, he ate his supper, 
went out to the garden, got arrested. In the morning, he was in the praetorium. The Jews would not enter so that they could eat the Passover later that day. At the end of the day, Yeshua dies at the time the Passover lambs are being killed. And then they hurried and got his body off the cross before the Sabbath because that first day, that 15th day of Abib, which is the first day of unleavened bread, is a high holy Sabbath. That is a yearly Sabbath where we are told to rest. So that's the Sabbath from which they got his body off the cross board. That was a, so that was a Wednesday night that year he was here. Okay. So that was the 14th of Abib as the 15th began. Now I'm going to quickly pause and I saw some questions. Um, the places it says to not do pastor. Okay. So Deuteronomy 16 is very specific. Um, Leviticus 17 in the Hebrew says, don't sacrifice to goat demons. You shall no longer offer your offerings wherever you see fit. Um, and then we're going to be reading the book of John. Mark the time and show him I come. Mark the time so I can come back later. Can you please be more specific so she knows what you're referring to? Oh, okay, Stephanie, I think we answered that question. Okay, good. I just want to make sure I got it. Now, so we understand Yeshua did not eat Passover. He could not have eaten Passover. That right in the book of John shows that. The book of Matthew. Here's the thing I try to point out to people. I'm like, look at the book of John. They're like, no, just look at Matthew and Mark. I'm like, if Matthew and Mark contradict Exodus and Deuteronomy, why are you choosing those above John, which matches exactly? <laughs> Bruh. <laughs> Bruh, <laughs> bruh, let's find the, like, the, act, the text of translation that actually matches what the scripture said was going to happen. Like, I, I, and they don't even, they, they, it's like I get this blank look and I'm like, why are you choosing Mark? Why are you choosing the book of Matthew over John? Look at John. And they're like, well, we like Matthew says he ate it. It's because they want to do Passover in their gates. And it's like, dude, there was over 2,000 translations of Matthew by European people who were confused. They didn't understand Passover. Okay. Yeah, I know. Bruh, right? Bruh. Okay. I want to start in chapter 11 because this is going to talk about the, the events leading up to Yeshua's death. Here's what we're going to ask because I can't read the comments as we're going. Can we hold the comments and questions until I get to the end of the chapter and then, and then we'll take a break at each chapter. Um, um, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. I can't please everybody. <laughs> I just got to do it. And then you can always slow it down, I think, later. And we just have to, I try to do what I can. Um, but I'm told I speak, yeah, everybody, you know, you just do what you got to do. We just try our best. Okay. Now, chapter 11 of the book of John. Now, a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary. Now, Mary is not a word in Hebrew. It's Miriam and her sister, Martha. It was that Martha who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and washed washed his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Yeshua heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be, God may be glorified through it. Whoa! Are some of you going through things right now that's for the glory of God, and instead of listening to God and waiting for God, you've run to doctors? Have some of you, like Lazarus, died for the glory of God to be shown. Do you understand that you are God's vessel through whom he wants to show his glory? Do you understand that he has chosen you to make his signs and wonders known? And if you go to man over some things, you're not letting him because what if, what if it's even in the allowance of him to use you as an example of how to be humble and repent from sins. I've had that a lot. I've had things where my sickness or something that happened to me was because of my sin. And I had to let God show that through me. I didn't run to a doctor. I didn't run anywhere else but to him. And I confessed my sin, exposed my sin. So it would be known his glory, his glory that he will convict and expose sin and cause us and help us to overcome. Right? Okay. Um, we are reading from the book of John chapter 11. Jackie, I hope that makes sense. And verse... Four, when Yeshua heard that, okay, I'm sorry, verse five. Now Yeshua loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place. He literally didn't rush to help. He waited. Some of you will have felt that in me. I wait to reach back out to you because I know God has to speak through you first. Sometimes I know God has to speak to you first. There are times when people have asked me for help and questions where I have been told by God, hold back. They're not seeking me. They're not waiting for me. They won't even listen. They're in a frenetic pansy. Or fr frenetic frenzy. Why did I say pansy? 
I was thinking panic and I was joined those two words. Can you tell I'm tired? <laughs> that was so funny. Okay, so he waited. He could have just rushed there and hurry up and healed him, but he knew his faith, he had to wait. He had to wait. I was not a helicopter mom. Please don't be a helicopter parent. Your children are going to have to fall to learn God's voice. Your children are going to have to experience their own salvation moment. Your family, your friends, your husband, get off his back, pray, love, let God work. Okay, so this is like, I think this is what Yeshua was doing. He's waiting. He knew he could just rush there and heal him, but this had to happen. He had to test the faith of, faith of Martha. He had to test the faith of Mary. He had to, Lazarus had to be willing to die as a sign. Okay, notice they didn't go to any doctors. Notice they weren't doing any of that stuff. They were waiting for the Lord. Okay. Um, then, okay, verse Seven. Then after this, he said to his disciples, the word disciples is students, is Talmudim, means students. Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi just means great or exalted one, and he is the only person we should ever call Rabbi. Lately, the Jews sought to stone you, and you're going there again? Yeshua answered, are there not 12 hours in a day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps. That means death. So Yeshua knew, yet the Holy Spirit had revealed to him, okay, he's dead now. He sleeps. But I go that I may wake him up. So they don't understand, because the word in Hebrew, when somebody dies, you say they slept, like they rested with their fathers, they slept. And they're thinking right here, though, that it was the physical sleeping, not just the eternal sleeping. They, they didn't realize, the disciples didn't realize he had died, but Yeshua knew. That's why he knew it was time to go. He, the Spirit told him, now it's time. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get well. However, Yeshua spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Yeshua said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. One of you, um, I'm not going to say who, but recently had a panic attack with your daughter. And you kept calling me, calling me, calling me, and of course I was outside, so I had no cell phone. And you, you prayed to God, and your daughter was helped. You prayed. You prayed, right, for I'm glad for my sake, for I'm glad for your sake that I was not available right then. I'm glad for your sake that you saw that God hears you, that you saw Yahweh hears you, that he's close to you, that he loves you. Do you understand? Sometimes where I have to back out of the way, if you're putting too much emphasis on me over Yahweh, do you understand that? Sometimes it has to be you have to know God is with you. Okay, <clears throat> or anybody, not just me. I don't mean it just me, but I mean anybody. Like, hi, Che Che. I love my baby. He's so cute. <laughs> See that little one right there? That Trey Smith? That's my son. He's so cute. <laughs> okay. Um, verse 12. <clears throat> I'm sorry, verse 4. Verse 16. She's Louise. Um, then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Because <laughs> they're like, well, Man, these people are threatening to kill Yeshua because like, they were trying to get him not to go, right? Because they're like, man, they were like, the Jews sought to stone you. You're going back? And so Thomas, valiant, is like, let's go with him. We'll die too. I love that. Doubting Thomas. <laughs> but here he is, like very resilient and very uh, resolute. Um, oh, and his wife is there too. Awesome. Sierra on the phone. How cute. I love you, Catherine. So when Yeshua came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. <laughs> but that was ripe. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Yeshua was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Yeshua, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. She's like, if you had been here, you wouldn't have died. Now, he waited two days. He, Well, two days isn't four days. So he would have been there two days after he died if he had not tarried. But she's like, if you had just come when we sent for you. So I'm assuming at some point they had sent to him before he died because he was sick. And she's like, if you had just come, like he wouldn't have died. Can you hear the anguish in her heart? She, she believed in him, but she was confused. I think a lot of you are in this moment. So that's why I'm pausing on this. Many of you are like, Lord, you can heal me. Lord, you can take away this problem. Lord, you can pay my bills. Lord, you can give me my job back. Lord, you can help me. Lord, you can save me. Where are you? Where were you? And for your sake, 
Oh, that makes me cry. I'm so sorry. For your sake, he has to let these hard things happen to you so that your faith can grow. And you don't know how many nights I spend getting the messages from you. I get hundreds of messages a day. And my heart breaks for you and the pain that you're going through. But I know God is doing a good work in you. And without the fulfillment and the, the fruition and the fullness of this work being played out in you, without the death of Lazarus happening to test your faith, you won't know. So some of you are going to go through sickness, affliction, disease. Some of you are going to go through financial troubles and turmoil and lose everything you have. Because it is going to produce the good work of righteousness in you. It is going to bring about the faith in you that you don't have. And if you take away the hard times and the trials, you will never get that faith. And as a mama bear, ah, you want to stop it. And that's what too many Americans do with their children. We stop the hard lessons and our children don't grow and learn. We stop the blessings of the lessons. We stop what needs to really happen to get them to that place of faith. So here's Martha pleading, Lord, if you had been here, Lord, if you had just been here, wouldn't have been, this wouldn't have happened. But even now you can heal him. Ugh. Yeshua said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. <laughs> so she's like, so she's like, you know, and I think some of you have this too, like you're afraid to hope in the blessings, he's, the promise he's given you. Yeah, I, I know, I know he'll rise again on the, res, the resurrection, but he was talking like, no, he's going to live. I'm going to raise him from the dead. Yeshua said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Yeshua is the resurrection and the life. And if you are in him and believe in him, you will commit to his commandments and obey him. And you will be given new life from death. But if you don't believe in him and you trample his blood and you say, oh, well, I know he's the son of God, like the demons even believe in trample. Um, that's not belief. That's understanding and knowing he's the son of God. But belief is committing to him and saying, Okay, because I believe in you, I'm going to accept that spirit you give me. You're going to raise me from the dead. I don't have to stay in my sinful ways. I am resurrected from my dead and lawful, lawless deeds now to lawfulness. I am resurrected in the same way of God. I'm given new life. That's what born again is. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Verse 28. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, the teacher has come and is calling for you. And I think many of you do this. You got confused by what's happening. You didn't understand the words of Yeshua. So you kind of just go back to your work and like, well, I don't know, he's not talking to me. Um, Mary, you go talk to him. Mary, you go, like he's calling for you. Yeshua hadn't called for her. Martha was just so, just didn't know what to do. She's like, oh, okay, I, I, you see, I'm going to, she was just fumbling inside. She didn't have the complete faith and resolute faith. And I think a lot of you are struggling with that right now. You're not understanding what the Father's speaking to you. And so your confusion is taking over. You kind of run from the Father. <laughs> Yeshua. I'm sorry. Yeshua is not the Father. But you run from the Father. And Yeshua is working to get you to the Father. Yeshua is God. Don't get me wrong. I feel like I had to caveat everything because <laughs> I get blasted on the internet all the time. I just realized what I was doing. Okay. You know what I'm saying. Okay. Verse 29. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. So Mary gets up. Miriam gets up and runs to him. Now Yeshua had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, she is going to the tomb to weep there. So they're like, oh, where's Mary going? Let's follow her. <laughs> she's probably just trying to get a moment alone. And she's like running to meet Messiah and they're like following her. Let's go too. At least that would have been me. I've been trying to go alone and here's all these people. Ah. <laughs> then when Mary came where Yeshua was and saw him, she fell down at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Yeshua saw her weeping, because I can just see this moment, she's just sobbing. Lord, if you had been here. I shouldn't be crying right now, but these things touch me. And I know some of you are going through this. Again, here she's like, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Therefore, when Yeshua saw her weep, I'm so sorry that I'm crying. This is so dumb. But this is me. <laughs> this is how Yahweh touches my heart all the time. Um, therefore, when Yeshua saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. He's compassionate. He's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and he said, where have you laid him? 
they said to him, Lord, come and see. Yeshua wept. Yeshua wept. He's touched by your hurt. Please don't ever think, those of you who are going through sickness, trials, divorces, abandonments, betrayals, don't think he doesn't see your tears. But he's letting you go through this for the perfect word to be completed in you. So Yeshua wept, and then the Jews said, See how he loved him? And some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also kept this man from dying? Everybody's questioning, now, why did he do I have gone through so many things in my life, and people say, Why did he let you go through that, Mel? Why did he let you go through that? And I know. Because I needed to understand more of his grace, his power, his mercy. I needed to see more of the depths of the wickedness of my soul sometimes. I needed to see where I was unfaithful or had lack of faith, I should say. I wasn't unfaithful. I mean, like, where my faith was weak. Where I had to understand in the fiery furnace that even if God says no, that I say, I don't care. Praise Yahweh. That I don't have a right to be disgruntled about my bad situation. And that I need to learn to rejoice in those trials. Rejoice in the bad things too because that's for my good and refinement. That's why Yahweh is going to let us go through the tribulation. For those of you who say, why is he letting his bride who he loves go through the tribulation? Because that will complete the perfect word, perfect work of humility and righteousness and purification in our life. It will work in us. It will work in us, producing the good works that are necessary to us to be like our Messiah. Believe me, in your hurt, when you don't understand, and you're like Mary and Martha, and you're like, why? Why is this happening? You could stop this. It doesn't mean he's angry or mean or nasty, but he sees the perfection of the work that needs to be completed in you. He sees the faith he is growing in you. He sees the refinement process you need. Cling to him. Trust him. Have faith in him and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Just say yes. Accept it. Okay, <clears throat> verse 38. Then Yeshua, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Yeshua said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench, for he's been dead four days. Yeshua said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of Elohim? Then he took away the stone from the place where the man, dead man was lying, and Yeshua lifted up his eyes and said, Father, there's a difference between the father and the son. Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said that, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And I was saying, <laughs> I don't know how to say Lazarus in Hebrew, to be honest, because there's no Lazarus. I know it was a bull, bull. And that's like, come. And he, when, and he who had died came out, bound hand and, hand and foot with grave cloths, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Yeshua said to them, Loose him and let him go. Now, Lazarus, this story, wow, is deep. Look at all the pictures for us. Look at all the things you're going to have to lay down in your life like Lazarus. You're going to have to have faith. You have to let that perfect work of faith when you don't understand the trials and tribulations around you. You have to be like Mary and Martha. And also, this is a picture of being born again from the dead. We who were dead and laid in the grave. Yeshua, through his mighty resurrection that is about to come. That's, I think, why this happened right here. He was about to come forth from the dead, the grave himself, Yeshua was. And his resurrection is making, when made the way for us to be resurrected from the dead. Right? His resurrection is how we were going to come alive again. We are going to come alive again. And spiritually, he gave us the Holy Spirit to even help us to be born again. Now, they've always had to be born again. Moses had to be born again. Elijah had to be born again. They had to love God and turn from lawless deeds to lawfulness. They had to forsake lawlessness. And you can see in, in the Bible, that's very clear because the, the kings of Israel says he was a wicked king. He did wickedness. And then this was a good king. He did righteousness according to the law. There were people who were born again doing righteousness according to the Torah. And there were people doing wickedness who fought against the Torah. And all of them were believers and children of Israel. And so this story of us coming from the dead is when we're in dead works, lack of faith, anything rising from the dead. And that was, this is a foreshadowing of, of Yeshua showing us what he was going to do, the power that was going to be given to us spiritually and physically through his resurrection. Okay, any, um, yes. Okay, 
Awesome. Okay, yeah, I have a tiny print right now. That's why I'm struggling to read this. I should have pulled out the other book, but I love this Bible. Okay, verse 45. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 44. And he who had died came, I already read that. Loose him and let him go. Okay, we talked about that. Verse 45. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things that Yeshua did believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Yeshua did. Oh my gosh. <laughs> they literally just saw a dead man come to life. They didn't even have faith. They weren't happy. They didn't rejoice in God for the good work. They went and told him, did you see what he did? He raised the dead to life. <laughs> Then the chief priests and Pharisees gathered a council and said, what shall we do for this man works many signs? If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. So they can't even see the good works God's doing again. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, this is, I want to point this out because Caiaphas was not a believer, but he was anointed of God. So listen to where tr truth is, where truth is found. Okay, listen. You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. Now this he did not say in his own authority. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Yeshua would die for the nation. There are people in the Christian church who have spoken many true words. Because the anointing of God helped them. So just because somebody is doing something wrong doesn't mean they're all wrong. You need to, though, discern that Caiaphas was not necessarily a good person, but Yahweh still anointed that position. And people have asked me many times, when this third temple's here, will you go to Jerusalem and sacrifice? Absolutely. But what about that they don't have Yeshua yet? Caiaphas was in Judaism, a wicked man, probably, and many, probably a Pharisee, and he prophesied. Je Yeshua still went to that temple. The Pharisees, the disciples still went to that um, temple. We see the book of Paul, we see in the book of Acts, John's, I'm so tired today. Paul's still going to that temple. Like you don't, like if it's God's way, he's still going to use imperfect people to get his word done. Do not stay in the church system. But what my point is here is just because you can't just say, oh, they do this wrong, so I'm not listening to what they say. Like nobody's perfect. Wisdom is where wisdom is found. Okay. Um, okay, so now this, listen to verse 51 again. Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Yeshua would die for the nation and not for that nation only. Listen, listen, ears alert, ears alert, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Remember in the book of Hosea? Remember in the book of Genesis? Remember all through scripture where it said the 10 northern tribes were scattered and sent to the Gentile nations? Yeshua died. What is the good news? Why was the good news sent to these Gentiles? They were the dispersed of Israel. So, not for that nation only, not for the Jews, but also for the Israelites who had been scattered. Another little reference there for those of you who, who are understanding the two houses of Israel, okay? Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that a beautiful picture? Verse 53, then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death because his signs and wonders were glorifying God, but it contradicted their, <laughs> it contradicted their system. How many miracles, how many truths, how many people have been set free from our, just the last six months in teachings? Thousands, thousands, thousands. And these Christians keep fighting it because it contradicts the religious system. We must get out of religion. We must stay at the feet of Yahweh, right? Get out of religion or we're going to hate the truth. Get out of religion or we're going to fight the very truth that's sent there to set us free. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Therefore, Yeshua, no, listen, listen, this is in our prophecy. Therefore, Yeshua no longer walked openly among the Jews, remember Judah, but went from there into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim and there remained with his disciples. Cassandra, Cassandra, Cassandra Alfonso, Please tell me what you see. <laughs> Cassandra, what do you see? Cassandra, here, do you want to join? Here, let me see. I don't know if I can do this. I don't know how to do it. Okay, people. Um, if I go over here, I'm not, you don't have to, Cassandra, if you don't feel like it, but I don't know how to do it, I guess. What do you guys see in that? Who We just read about, like, he went. he's going to gather together to the first children of God, who are the ten northern tribes of Israel that were scattered, they were the Ephraimites. They were called Ephraim in the Bible. Okay, I'm not going to get you on, Cassandra. I didn't do it. <laughs> That's okay. You can be in your PJs. Guys, this is another prophecy of the return, like Yeshua's job. He went from the Jews to Ephraim because what happened at Pentecost? All of a sudden, Peter and the disciples were told to open the ministry, open the truth to the Gentiles again. The ten northern tribes, it was time for them to start returning. 
And they began returning at the feast of first of, of Pentecost, which is whole because there's two first fruits. There's the first feast for first fruits during the week of Passover, and the um, that's the first fruits of the barley harvest, and then there's the first fruits of the wheat harvest. The wheat symbolize the children of God. And do you guys see the picture? Do you see the picture? Okay. Do you guys see the picture? This is beautiful. This is beautiful. Like this is a prophecy. Again, he's gonna the 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 gospel is going to go, not just from the Jews now, out to the Gentiles who were the scattered tribes of Ephraim. Okay, and we are in, I think somebody just asked, and I think they've posted it a few times on here, but um, we are chapter, chapter John chapter 11, verse 55. I just want you guys to like really make note of that though. In John chapter 11 here, those are two prophecies, two verses that literally prophesy and show that the, ten, the Gentiles were the 10 other tribes of Israel and that it was going to them. <laughs> Like the message was going to them. That's like a beautiful thing. Okay, I hope you see that. Okay, verse 55. And the Passover of the Jews was near. Now it's not, the only reason they put of the Jews there, and I do think that's from the translational text errors, but it really was it's because that's who was keeping it, the Passover, right? It's not that it's only for the Jews. We read in Exodus 12, 49, that any Gentile is supposed to keep it as well if they believe in God. Um, and so, and the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Please remember that. You don't get to eat Passover. Yourself. You had to go to Jerusalem, right? We're told in the book of, um, a few times in the book of Deuteronomy, three times a year, all the males have to go to Jerusalem to keep Passover, right? Sometimes even the women didn't eat it because they had to stay home and watch the farm. It was commanded of the men. Okay, so. They had to go and purify themselves to eat the Passover. Remember in the book of 2 Chronicles and Hezekiah, they didn't purify themselves properly and therefore they got sick. So if you aren't purified, don't you dare eat the Passover. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Don't do the past, don't do sacrifices in your own gates. Deuteronomy 16. And right here, you had to be purified to eat it. Okay. Then, and that's according to the law, the Moses law. So then they sought Yeshua and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think? That he'll come to the feast? Now both, <laughs> duh. <laughs> now, when, <laughs> now both the chief priests and Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it that they might seize him because they were going to try to arrest him. Okay, quickly, I'm going to pause. Like I said, at the end of the chapter, questions. Any questions about what we read? Stay relevant. Stay relevant. Do not get us on side tangents. We're not going to go there yet. Um, how do we come purified before the Passover feast? Exactly. That is a good question, Adnija. So it is, it's a mikvah. And for three days before the Passover, you were supposed to abstain from relations. You're supposed to, um, you're supposed, you just had to stay away from corpses, dead bodies. And if you were you not purified to eat it at this month, then you would eat it the second month. There was a, there was a, a rule that said you could eat it the second month. Now, you had to be purified. And so and the mikvah is like a baptism. And so you would have to get washed, be cleansed. You would stay away from relations with your husband. If you were on your period, if, a menstrual cycle for a woman, you would not be eating Passover because you couldn't go in the temple to defile it. And so... Um, yeah, so you had to be purified, set apart, cleaned. Now, remember we, Yahweh did that many times, tell them to wash and wash their clothes and for three days wait, and then he was going to meet with them on the mountain. Um, exactly, stay away from people. Like, exactly, you had, you're going to the temple. It's a holy set up place, set aside place. You had to be purified. The Passover is a sacrifice. Please read Exodus again in 12. It says it a couple times, it calls it a sacrifice. And there's other chapters as well. Sacrifices are only done at the place where God put his name. We used to do them in our own homes until Leviticus said, nope, don't you dare do any sacrifices in your own gates. You can eat meat in your gates and slaughter them, but you cannot, that which is offered to Yahweh has to be done at the prescribed place. And then we're shown that once we had the prescribed place, that if he took it away from us, then we're in a period of time out and punishment. So once we understood what we had, that he said, I'm taking my feast away from you. It doesn't say you can go do them in America. It says you have to wait then until I restore them. Just like Ezra and Nehemiah says. Um, so Cassie, that's a good question, sweetie. So we, we remember the Passover, but we, we can eat the last supper, but we are, we're commanded not to. And so what Zephaniah 318 says is 
Those who mourn for the feast shall return. Well, why is God going to, why does God tell us those we're mourning for the feast? He took them away from us. And the reason we're mourning is because we realized our unrighteous deeds took them from us. Like Daniel says, Hosea says, Ezekiel says, and Lamentation says. We didn't lose the feast because we were good people. He took them from us from, for, uh, because of our sin, okay? So he took them from us because of our sin. And because we were transgressing, he said, you don't get this. So it's just like a child sending them a timeout. Well, we got scattered by the Assyrian army, and then my family are Jews, so we got scattered by the Babylonians. We came back. But there was another dispersion that happened after the Roman Empire came and destroyed the temple in 70 AD. There was another huge dispersion of the children of Israel that were there, which were the Jews. And at that point, the gospel message, the truth, went out to Ephraim, went out to those 10 tribes that were scattered, like we just read up here in chapter 11. Because the door was opening for the return of them to come. And that was the first fruits of the wheat harvest. The first fruits. You guys right now, us, we're the end. We're the fulfillment, the fullness of the end of the wheat harvest. And so now this is a time where we're going to have it restored. If you read Ezekiel chapter 45, Yeshua is coming back. And when he cleanses the temple, it says he will lead us in the feast of Passover and the offerings and sacrifices. Notice he doesn't say we can do it in our home still. He's like, we do it there at the temple. And so when we eat when you do, okay, let me ask it this way, put it this way. Any other sacrifices we were told to keep forever. All of the sacrifices we were told to do forever, forever, just like Passover. And we were told, we were shown that they were pictures and um, prophecies of our Messiah. Do we sacrifice lambs and goats and rams within our gates? No. And everybody, nobody has a question with that. Nobody has a question with that right? They say, right, we don't sacrifice in our own homes. We can't. We don't have the set aside prescribed altar. The Passover is a sacrifice. Passover is not just a day of the year. It literally says it's the Passover sacrifice. Well, the other seven sacrifices, seven of them, we don't even try to like do in our homes. But a lot of people Yes, the beautiful story of Passover is beautiful, but it's a sacrifice. So we have to realize that our sin has caused us to be dispersed to where we are. We are to repent from that sin of our forefathers. And we're supposed to say, hey, I, have, I am so sorry. I acknowledge my sin. We mourn for what we lost through the disobedience of our fathers and us. We mourn for that loss. And then we ask, we cry out for the restoration. And we wait because we have the hope and the restoration, kind of like Mary and Martha there. Yeshua is coming back to raise us up from the dead, the dry bones of Israel we're raising up and he will bring us back to the land of Israel. Ezekiel 47 is extremely clear on that. Any Gentile that wants to come also gets to live with us. So we don't get to eat a Passover dinner. We do get together at the end of the 14th day as the 15th is starting because we are commanded to do the Feast of Unleavened Bread in all of our dwellings. So go back and listen to the, the video I made on the Feast of Yahweh again. Passover, it says only at the place where he put his name. It says the Feast of Unleavened Bread in all of your dwellings. Keep those two Sabbaths, the first and the seventh day, and do it in your homes. The Feast of First Fruits, you had to take the first fruits of your Abib barley harvest to the temple. Well, we can't really do that here. Um, and then Feast of Shavuot, the reason the whole world was gathered to Jerusalem at the Feast of Pentecost, Shavuot, was because that's where they were commanded to do it. They didn't get to do it in their gates. The Feast of Tabernacle, or Feast of Yom Teruah, Feast of Trumpets, we can do, we're told to do it in all of our gates because everybody, wherever they are, will see the return of the Messiah. Day of Atonement, we're told to do it in all of our gates. Feast of Tabernacles, we're told to do it at Jerusalem. And so we have to make sure that we don't parse apart the scripture and obey the law how we choose how we want to do it. We have to say, God, how did you tell us to do it? And then we see very clear examples, like in 2 Chronicles 30, Ezra and Nehemiah, where they did not make replacement ceremonies in, outside of the land of Israel until they returned. Once they returned from captivity, then they got to have the joyful, restorative celebration of the Feast of God in the way that was supposed to be done. They didn't make replacement ceremonies. Those who did make replacement ceremonies are the Pharisees and Sadducees who began Judaism. So the Mishnah and all of those extra books that were starting to be codified, they are the ones, the religious people who would not simply follow the heart of Yahweh's spirit in Torah. They began to disobey the commandment of God to hold to their tradition of men. The commandment of God says, don't you dare eat this in your own homes. 
right? The, the, the tradition of man says you can make a Seder with a Babylonian fertility egg on it, right? So we will get the feast again when Yahweh restores it according to his commandments. Okay. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Now, there was a lot of comments, but for the sake of time, I'm going to keep going. Um, and, and then if there's anything that's extremely important to be addressed again, we'll, we'll hit it at the end here. But I want to keep going some more here. Okay. I'm switching to my iPad, so <laughs> I'm not struggling to read. Tiny print. T why do they make books with tiny print? Why do they make them? Ooh. Okay, I love that book. I had it open to something else I was reading earlier. So let me get over here to John chapter 12. <clears throat> Yochanan chapter 12. Come on, come on. My iPad's fried. Come on. Maybe I need to go back over to the... Okay, never mind. It fried up on me. I'm just going to go over here. So you'll just bear with me. Okay. Then six days before Passover, Yeshua came to Bethany where Lazarus was who had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Yeshua and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, so this is a student, the betrayer, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. I'm going to tell you, that is 99% of Christian pastors. <laughs> they are stealing from the work of God to have a building and provide for their own homes. The book of Micah, specifically in chapter 3, says, we're not supposed to preach, the prophets are not supposed to preach for profit or pay, or pre, <laughs> pastors are not supposed to teach for pay and prophets are not supposed to prophesy for money. Moses didn't get paid. Elijah didn't get paid. So when somebody's starting to get paid and they say, this, this money should be given to the poor. I don't, I don't see churches, messianic groups, people give to the poor. I see them give to a pastor who could go get a job. I work at least 60 hours a week messaging with you guys, helping you, making videos, and I don't get paid because you know what? That's my job, what God gave me to do. You should be out there. You are all witnessing and ministering 30, 40, 50, 60, 800, who knows? Your whole life, if you have little ones, you aren't getting paid for it. That's your duty. We don't get paid to peddle the word of God. We don't get paid to have to be bribed. Now, if I was a Levite, which we are, so my son may need to leave his home for rotational duty during the Levitical order of the service that is in Jerusalem when the temple is restored. At that point, the tithes are laid up at the temple for him so he has food to eat when he's there. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> he had to leave his land. The person, the Levites had to leave their land for rotation to go serve. Okay? They were provided for. Otherwise, that money that you have extra is to go for the poor, the widow, and the stranger to help God's kingdom. Not a building with a phallic symbol on top. Okay. So you give it to the poor. So, um, believe me, if you ever need to know where people are always reaching out to me, telling me their problems. So if you need to be connected with somebody who needs the money, let me know. I've had a number of you try to pay me. I refuse every time. No, you're not paying me. But you can. Like if people send gifts, like little things they make me. Okay, great. I wear my little Leah Z, Z out all the time. That's, I mean, whatever. We can bless people. That's not what I'm talking about. You can be kind to people. You can be good to people. And you can be thankful. We're supposed to uplift our teachers and, and, and encourage them. But you don't pay me to teach you because the minute you do that, there's a bribe, a spirit of bribery that comes on it and there, then people get afraid to speak the truth. I work for God. I'm not going to coddle you and I'm going to love you. I'm going to speak the truth, right? Not based on my salary. Ooh, if I speak the truth, I'll lose all these people paying for my whatever I'm doing, right? No, 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 no. But there's plenty of poor people around you by Bibles, by food. Ask the Lord. He's going to open your eyes to all those around you, okay? Yes, send me dark chocolate with sea salt, Dark chocolate with sea salt or dark chocolate with mint, seven, yeah, well, the darker the better. Yeah. <laughs> Jenny, how did you know me? <laughs> oh, I know. It's my, it's my like only little thing, but it's not, I don't do the high sugar one. Okay. My point is, I bless you all. I give you gifts. You give me gifts. We, that's different, but you don't bribe me. You don't pay me to do this. Elijah didn't get paid. Moses didn't get paid. In fact, Elisha, they tried to pay him. And he said, absolutely not. We don't do this for pay. Yeah, they will provide. Um, ooh, ah, so, okay, Diane, tell me yours. Okay, so the Theo, just, this is so random. 
the dark chocolate from Theo with sea salt, the 70% dark. Oh my gosh. And I usually like it darker, but I had, that's what they had. My sister sent it to me. <gasps> it's like the best. And then there's this Panama dark chocolate that has like, it's like 80% or something dark with cacao nibs in it. Oh, so oh my gosh. Back to human chocolate. <laughs> okay. Hi guys. Okay. I love you guys. Okay. Now I want to keep reading. I know. Got off on the thing, a little thing there. Um, but because I wanted to point out like Judas is like a lot of these pastors. These pastors are Judas and and they're betraying Yeshua because they're stealing from him his beautiful bride. They're teaching them lies. They're not teaching them how to repent from their lawless deeds. They're not getting them ready for Yeshua. They're setting them up for judgment. They're like literally putting them in the bullseye of the judgment crosshair. That's what pastors are doing. They're putting them in the bullseye because you're only punished for breaking God's laws. Like that's what brings judgment on you when you disobey God. So here's the pastor is like, pay me. I'll steal the money from you and I'm going to put you right in the crosshairs. Duh, that's so dumb. Okay, verse seven. But Yeshua said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there and they came not for Yeshua's sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also. Oh, are you guys suffering persecution for the good works God is doing in you? Are you being called false prophets, heretics, cult leaders, cult members? Are you guys being persecuted? Because they're trying to now put you to death because you believed what Yeshua said. They're trying to put you to death because of the truth of God that you're following. And you are a sign and a testimony. You have been risen from the dead. You are the dry bones of Ezekiel coming to life, right? The whole house of Israel coming back from the dead. And now they're trying everything in their power to cut you down, get you off track and lead you the wrong way. Okay. Because in a, a little bit, okay. They tried, they plotted to put Lazarus to death also because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Yeshua. And because of you, and many are following, believing in the Messiah, the, the obedient, law-giving, Torah-believing God, Yeshua HaMashiach. People are starting to turn because of me and because of you. And they want to put us to death, just like they did our Messiah. <laughs> okay, my dry bones rejoice. Yes! Sometimes I want a little bit more moistness in my joints as I'm getting older. <laughs> okay. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Yeshua was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hoshana. It's Hoshana. Don't say Hosanna. It's Hoshana in Hebrew. Hoshana is saved now. Blessed is he who comes. Baruch haba b'shem Yahweh Elohim. Baruch haba. Blessed is he who comes. Baruch haba b'shem Yahweh. Baruch haba b'shem Yahweh. The king of Israel, Melech Israel. Then Israel, when he had, uh, not Ha Israel, Melech Israel. Then Yeshua, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written. Okay, Atlas, Mavis, Isabel, Everly, Grace and Lily, if you're listening. This is the little Hakamor song. This is what the little donkey song that we sing about is talking about. This is the little donkey that took Yeshua to Jerusalem. <laughs> okay, so then Yeshua, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Oh, he rode on a donkey. Um, and that comes from Zechariah, just so you know. And Ted Pierce has a beautiful song from this, this um, about this verse right here. So here's our king coming on a donkey. If they didn't have the law and the prophets, they wouldn't have known this. But when you knew the book, here's your king coming on a donkey. Isn't that beautiful? Like here's Yeshua fulfilling the prophecy from Zechariah. Here's your king. Here's your king. He's on a donkey. And these people who knew the law but had added extra rules to it missed it. And here's what we see in the Christian faith. They say they know the Bible, but they added extra. They took away the rules and they added their own interpretation. They're missing who Yeshua is. They're missing this greatest event, one of the greatest events of all time. The awakening of the two houses of Israel, the restoration of the dry bones of Israel. They're missing it because of their religion. Praise Yahweh that you have eyes to see and continue to speak loudly and pray fervently that their hearts be open. His disciples did not understand these things at first. So don't feel bad when you don't get it at first. But when Yeshua was glorified, when he was raised from the dead, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. I always tell Danielle and Morgan in specific, don't 
don't, you don't have to understand immediately. Stay faithful and in humbleness, ask God to reveal to you what is being said to you. Because in time, like Yeshua, these disciples, it took them about a week to understand what's going on, right? It took them a few days. It might take you a few days. It might take you months. It might make you, who knows, years. Therefore, the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. Now, I also want to point out the branches, the palm branches were very significant because that was how they declared their king. This is why many people faltered at the death of Yeshua. Because in the Hebrew tradition, we have Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David. Oh, there's my handsome husband. He just joined. Um, so Mashiach ben Yosef. Messiah, son of Joseph, is the suffering servant who was betrayed by his brothers. And Mashiach ben David comes ruling as the king of da King David in the lineage of Judah. Um, that's what Ezekiel prophesies about. Many Jews thought that Messiah was going to do both at the same time. And so they were coronating him, basically saying, we recognize you are king of Israel, right? Right here. They had the palm branches. They're saying, Baruch haba b'shem Yahweh, Baruch haba. They're saying, blesses. They understood this is the Messiah. This is the Mashiach. The king of it. He's the king of Israel. And then he died. And remember when Yeshua was walking on the way, when he hadn't revealed himself to his disciples, and they're like, we really thought he was the Messiah, but he died, and this doesn't make sense. They forgot or they didn't understand Isaiah 53 where he was going to be cut off for his people. And the book of Daniel talks about that same happening, right? He was going to be cut off first as Mashiach ben Yosef, Messiah, son of Joseph, the suffering servant. And when he comes back this second time, then they understood. Then they started to understand after his resurrection. He's coming back a second time as the Mashiach ben David, this Messiah, son of David. Okay. Now, <clears throat> Verse 19, for this reason, people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Hello, you Gentiles. This is a dance party for us. This is like, <laughs> this is like, a, you can prove. Where did the Gentiles go to follow God? If the Gentiles believed in God, where did they go? Oh, the Greeks also came up to the feast at Jerusalem. They didn't do it in America. They didn't do it in Athens. They didn't do it in Corinth. They didn't stay where they were. They were commanded to go to Jerusalem. <laughs> right? Right? Do we see how the Bible doesn't contradict itself? The word of God is so beautiful. If you just read, read, it like is so clear. Okay, so... Here we go. The Greeks came to worship at the feast because if you were a Gentile, Exodus 12, 49 said this same laws for you. If you want to keep the Passover, you want to believe in the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Israel. Guess what? Keep the same one. Exodus 12, 49, Numbers 15, 15 dash 16, Leviticus 19, 33 to 34, Leviticus 17, Isaiah 56, Ezekiel 47 says the same thing. The same law that's for the Jews and for the Israelites is also for you if you're a Gentile. And so that's why these Greeks were right here. So don't let them tell you that was only the Jews. That was only for the Jews. Buffalo, 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 loney, baloney, baloney, phony, baloney. That's just not true. The book of John's awesome. Okay, so then they came to Philip, who was from Bethesda of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Yeshua. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Yeshua. But Yeshua answered them, saying, Listen. The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. More, he's glorified through death and then resurrection. You are going to die to your flesh before you're raised again. You're going to look pretty, it's going to look pretty gruesome and ugly for you as the Father is cleansing you and purifying you. Remember, we die like Lazarus before we are raised from the dead. So the glorifying of God in your life looks kind of ugly to the world who doesn't understand what's happening to you. They're, they pity us because they don't understand. But we rejoice because we're like, okay, I'm being torn down, broken apart, refabricated in the image of my God and my Savior. Right? 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 Okay. So we die. He's going to die. And he says he's glorified, but he, he had to die first. He had to die first. Just like we have to die first before we are raised in, because we have to die to our flesh. No pride, no arrogance, nothing about us. So only God can be glorified. 
Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. When you die to yourself, wham, you bloom alive with the, the commandments, with the truth of God. Through obedience to the law, you die to the consequence of the penalty of the law. That's the, this, that's this process. Remember, we went through that in Galatians, through the, or is that Romans? Through the law, you're dead to the law because that's how you die. You overcome your flesh. The Holy Spirit overcomes your yuckiness, your wickedness, your pride, your arrogance, your anything contrary to God. Okay, he who loves his life will lose it. If you defend yourself, if you're arrogant, if you're defensive, if you want to stand up for yourself, if you're going to do things your own way, you're going to lose it. You're going to lose it. God's going to take it from you. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If you let yourself be made a spectacle, if you let yourself be purified, refined, humbled, and broken in this life, you will gain eternal life. That's what I want. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my Father will honor. You're going to have to die to yourself. You're going to have to bear your cross. You're going to have to be hated by others, not opening your mouth, defending yourself, pointing out what they're doing wrong to you. You're going to have to lay down your life and pray for them on the cross and say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. You must be made in the image of Messiah if you truly want to follow your Messiah. Um, verse 27, now my soul is troubled and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. <sighs> Father, glorify your name. And I want you all to do it for a minute. Let's do that. You're here at this hour for this very dark and troubling time on the earth, the tribulation. You are here to glorify God through the coming trials that are about to hit you. You are to be a testimony and witness to those around you. You are to be a sign to those around you of the glory and the faith of God. Do we want this? <laughs> nope. Is this tribulation going to be fun? Nope. Is this refining time going to be fun? Nope. What shall we say then? Father, save us from this hour. <sighs> Father, glorify your name. Right? So we surrender it. And that's a hard thing to do sometimes, but we need to. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Yeshua answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. Now this is a symbol all the way back to the book of Exodus. When the serpent was raised on the stake. That serpent was raised up and it said, oh, if you look at this, Moses said, look at this serpent on the stake and you will be healed. The serpent signifies the sin, the transgression, the, the Satan, the deceitfulness of Satan that had bit us, got us to sin against God. Satan gets us to disobey God's commandments and that causes us to be sick and we were hurting with the plague. So when Yeshua is raised up, what we are told is because we chose, what it's showing is that Yeshua is raised up just like that serpent was raised up. And what Yeshua is killing is the serpent's power over us. What Yeshua took away was serpent, the Satan's deceitful power that separated us from God. Because Satan kicked us out of, God has kicked out of the garden and separated from God eternally because we sinned. And so Yeshua died to take that yucky pain, the yucky bite of the serpent away boom, crucified it. Now, if we believe in him, follow him, repent from our sins, like we accept that blood that covered us, then we get to rise from the dead like Lazarus. We get to rise from the dead like Yeshua. So that's what he's saying. If I'm raised up, see, that's what that serpent on the stake was supposed to teach us about the Messiah coming. They started worshiping it, just like people worship their cross, and they had to get rid of it. Okay. This voice, okay, blah, 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 blah. If I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying what death he would die. The people answered him, <coughs> We have heard from the law that the Messiah remains forever. Well, that's true, because the law says that Messiah would be forever. The Torah said that the Messiah would be, like um, Ezekiel 45, very specifically, and 40 to 45 shows that when King David returns, the Messiah returns, he was going to live forever. So this is why they, some of them got confused because they were misunderstanding some of the scriptures. Um, and it's, he was going to live forever, but he's coming back the second time to rule forever. I hope that makes sense. Um, who, okay, 
We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever, and how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? So these are the people still quite not understanding what the Messiah meant, what the role of the Messiah was. Then Yeshua said to them, A little while longer the light is with you. Remember in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God separated the light from the darkness before the sun, moon, and stars were made. Yeshua and God's angels are the light. Satan and his people are the darkness. The light and darkness. The light is also, we're told that the Torah, the law of God, is the light. And we're told in the book of John, Yeshua is the word of God, right? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Yeshua, the Torah, go together, and they're the light of the world. They're both called the light. So he's talking about himself. The light, a little while longer, the light, I am with you. Not me, him. Walk while you have the light, but lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. These things Yeshua spark, spoke and departed and was hidden from them. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe because Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. And any of you who are thinking like, well, I believe in the Torah and I see this, but I may be quiet and keep going to church. Don't be like these people. Be bold. Who cares what they think of you? Just care what your, Yesha, what your Messiah thinks of you. Care what Yahweh thinks of you. We live for an audience of one. Believe me, many times I've had to give myself that pep talk when I was hated by all. I'm like, deep breath. I'm going to be hated. Speak for my God. Okay. So they didn't confess it because lest they be put out of the synagogue for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Are you being, are you loving the praise of your family or church members or other people more than the praise of God? Are you being silent when you should be speaking? Were you born for such a time as this? Just like Lazarus. Okay. Then Yeshua cried out and said, he who believes in me believes not in him, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And that's the father. And he who sees him sees, I'm sorry. And he who sees me sees him, sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Did you know that the very word that was spoken to Moses was from Yeshua? Did you know, again, here's a, a, a showing us that the law, remember the book of Hebrews says, all will be judged by the law of Moses without mercy on the account of two to three witnesses. The word that Yeshua spoke, every single word he quotes through the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is from the Torah. Every single scripture from the Torah, the law of Moses. Yeah, yeah, that's what's gonna judge us. Yeshua came to save us, but the law is going to stand as our judge, Right? For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command what I should say and what I should speak. So when Yeshua met with Moses on the mountain, he was speaking the very essence of the Father and the commandments of God. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. And this is why Revelation says the saints are those who have the testimony of Yeshua and keep the commandments of God. Because Yeshua's commandments are the commandments of God. Okay. You got it, Paula. Amen. Okay, chapter 13. I'm going to keep reading because I got to go to another meeting. Okay, now before the feast, before, before, in front of, in advance of, the feast of Passover, when Yeshua knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in his world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended. This is before the Passover. Before the Passover. This is the last supper. The devil, having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Yeshua, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, um, hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, oh, know who you are. That's why Yeshua wasn't, wasn't troubled. He knew he had come from God, and he knew he was going to God. You are God's child. You are hearing his truth. Rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a bowl and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he girded. Then he came to Simon Peter and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Pause, pause, pause. In the book of Matthew, Mark, 
I'm sorry, in the book of Matthew and Mark, where they mistranslate some of this through their 2,000 texts that they got wrong. They tried, at this Last Supper, they called it the Passover. He just said here, it's before the Passover. Now, this matches the story of Exodus. Keep list, keep with me, but I want you to pay attention. Matthew and Mark are wrong in this section. John is right. John matches Torah. Everything must align with Torah. Yeshua answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Because he, Peter's trying to be like righteous. No, you're not washing my feet. Yeshua answered him, If I don't wash you, you have no part with me. So Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. <laughs> I love Peter. And I love this. Like Yeshua's like, Peter, come on. Yeshua said to him, He who is bathed need only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean but not all of you. Now here he's talking about Judas. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. And the reason he was washing the feet, well, let's keep reading. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you, have also, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Now what does it mean to wash the feet? Your feet are what you walk in, the path that you are walking on. Now, when we, when we wash feet of others, we're taking them the word of God. Water is symbolic of the word of God. And the dirt is removed from their feet. Okay, so what it means is Matthew and Mark are wrong. Well, because, Kyla, the Matthew and Mark try to say that this last supper was Passover. But right here, it shows that this is before Passover. This matches. There's over 2,000 manuscripts of the book of Matthew alone in the Greek, and they all differ. And the translators are trying to put it together. The book of John has the timeline accurate. They don't match. And so Christians will say, oh, I just want to do the book of Matthew instead. No, the book of John is the one that matches Exodus. You have to go by the one that's accurate. So I'm not saying throw out the baby with the bathwater, but when they did the timeline of the Passover, they tried to say Yeshua was eating Passover in the upper room. That's false. And right here it shows this is before the Feast of Passover. That's accurate because you could not have legally, lawfully eaten Passover in an upper room. Okay, once we had that prescribed place. Okay, um... So we are to wash each other's feet. We are to get down. And, and so if you see me walking in unrighteousness in some way, you're to come to me with the word of God and gently help my feet get back on the path in correction. Um, and we do it for each other. We are servants of each other. None of us raise ourselves above each other, right? Okay. Okay. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent me. If you know those things, blessed are you if you do them. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. So Yeshua was telling him, there's one of you unclean. I see the betrayer. He's here. I'm telling you so that you see it when it happens. When Yeshua had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. Could you imagine, like, what? Who is it? Now there was leaning on Yeshua's bosom, one of his disciples, John, whom Yeshua loved. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask to him who it was whom he spoke. He's like, ask him, like, you're leaning on, like, ask him. And then leaning back on Yeshua's breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Yeshua answered, it is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. This is symbolic, guys. Let, let's listen. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the, Simon, the son of Simon. Judas is from the word Judah. And it's a brother of Yeshua, right? They're Jews. This is a fellow believer. Bread is symbolic of the word of God. Your betrayers will be the very ones with whom you share the word of God, the very ones whom you fellowship with. Your, your betrayers, our betrayer in the end day comes from the tribe of Dan, one of the Israelites. Judas is prophetic of the tribe of Dan here because Dan is the only tribe not sealed before the tribulation. That's Revelation chapter seven. Dan, we are told, will be the serpent by the way, the one who judges God's people. That's Rev, um, Genesis chapter 48. Now, our betrayers will be one close to us. You're often gonna be betrayed by your spouses, your friends, your siblings, your children, help you learning the, helping you learn the heart of God and how to overcome this and still be kind to your Judas. How do you pray? How do you live with your Judas right there with you? Because often Yahweh yeah, will kind of give you these warnings and signs. Okay. Now, 
He gave it to Judas. He knew who his betrayer was, but he, notice he didn't treat him badly. I'm sure Yeshua was saying, Lord, please, if it be your will, let him be spared. Like, you know, bring him to repentance. Um, okay, so he gave it to him. What you do, do quickly. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought, because Yeshua had, or because Judas had the money box that Yeshua had said to him, buy those things we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. Having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately, and it was night. Because remember, this is before the Passover, and they were like, maybe he was telling him to go buy things for the Passover. Verse 31, so when he had gone out, Yeshua said, now the son of man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. That word in Hebrew, there's no such thing as the word new in Hebrew. It's the word renewed. So he said, I'm going to renew this commandment with you. Love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. Like the law was always about love. <laughs> right? He's renewing this with them. Like do this. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And guys, we need to remember that. No backbiting, no gossip, no weird thoughts, no withdrawing from each other, no putting each other down, no tearing each other apart. We must love each other. It's okay to disagree on things and gently work through that in the spirit of humility and um, just seeking the truth of God. We are not to tear each other down. We are not to call each other names. We are to love one another because you are made in the image of God, as am I. We must treat each other with kindness and respect. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are, we, where are you going? Yeshua answered him and said, where I am going? You cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. Yeshua answered him, Will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall crow, shall not crow till you have denied me. Three times. Now the rooster, this is, there was a Levite who was, it was the Hebrew word for a rooster who many people, that's what they think this was. The Levite would wake up the Levites. But there's one Levite who was kind of like the alarm clock. And he was, he was one who would, Basically, they blow the shofar or whatever and wake everybody up. And that's what they think this is a reference to. Makes a lot of sense. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so... Okay, now, wait a minute. I'm going to stop here. Chapter 14 is him talking about a lot of things. We're not going to talk about that today because we're going to... It's good. Please go read it. But we want to talk about the timeline of the Passover. He prophesies things. He tells us things that are coming. He's telling us all these things. Now, we want to go over to chapter 17, just for time, because I do have to get to another teaching. In chapter 17, please go read that. It's like the interrogation process, him speaking and teaching them right before, right before the end. Chapter 17, Yeshua spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son may also glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Yeshua HaMashiach, whom you have sent. And there's two different. There's the Father and the Son. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given to me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. See, Yeshua's deity. He was there even before the world was created. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. Stop one second. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me. The words of the Father, which were the Torah. And they have received them and have known surely that I came forth from you and you have believed and, and sorry, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours and all mine are yours and yours are mine. And I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name, those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. Guys, we need to be one. We need to be one. And that word one is like what you would also use for a husband and wife. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, 
Though I have kept and none of them is lost except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you and these things I speak in the, to the, uh, in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. Guys, we're, we don't get raptured out of this tribulation coming. But that you should keep them from the evil one. And that's what Yeshua is praying over us now. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. The word of God sanctifies us. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself. Please, for the sake of your children and others you love, sanctify yourselves, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's you. That's me. That they all may be one, as you, Father, and I are in me, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent, sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me be, may be with me where I am, that they may be behold, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these have known that you sent me, and I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, and the, that the love which you have loved me, I'm sorry, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. 18 is where I want to get back to. When Yeshua had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples after over the brook Kedron. The last supper had just happened. He washed their feet. Now they went out to the garden. They went over the brook Kedron where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. So they go to the garden. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place for Yeshua often meant there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Yeshua, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Yeshua of Nazareth. Yeshua said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now, when he, all, when he had said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, Whom are you seeking? And they said, Yeshua of Nazareth. Yeshua answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go th their way, that the saying may be fulfilled which he spoke, or those who... Oh, guys, I'm having a hard, try hard, hard time reading these little, this little print. I'm so sorry. But the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke, of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. So Yeshua was like, let them go. Arrest me. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Yeshua said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I, shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? And remember, we've talked about this. You don't go around just rebuking demons. <laughs> you don't just go about, around rebuking things. Sometimes it's for the glory of God. Yeshua knew he was to lay down his life. Lazarus was to die for the glory of God. Remember at the beginning of our lesson, we talked about that? Okay. We have to make sure we are in line with the Holy Spirit when we are praying. And then we pray according to the will of the Father. Verse 12, Then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Yeshua and bound him, and they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And Simon Peter followed Yeshua, and so did another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and went with Yeshua into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door outside. Then the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. Then the servant girl who kept, his door said to, who kept the door said to Peter, you're not also one of this man's disciples, are you? I do want to point out the, <clears throat> the entrustment of the door was put into the hands of a woman. Just saying, those of you who, there's a lot of people who misunderstand scripture and twist it. The woman kept charge of the door to make sure who came in and out. Women weren't put down as much as they try to say they were. Um, and Yeshua very clearly says he's going to pour out his spirit on men's servants and maid servants. Joel chapter 2. And Deborah was the leader of Israel. Okay, anyway. So you are not also 
You're not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I'm not. Now the servants and officers who had made a fire of coal st um, stood there, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. So he was pretending to not know this Yeshua. He wanted to, he was pretending, because he thought if he pretended and hid, he could stay by Messiah. But he didn't realize in, in this he was sinning. And many of you have tried to like, well, I'll just, I'm not going to tell him what I believe, but I'm going to be here like covertly. Doesn't work. The, um... <clears throat> verse 19, the high priest then asked Yeshua about his disciples and his doctrine. Yeshua answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Yeshua with the palm of his hand saying, do you answer the high priest like that? Yeshua didn't answer incorrectly. But this man thought he did. He said, you're being irreverent. People will falsely accuse you, saying you're talking too rudely, too arrogantly, too this or that. No, sometimes they just don't want to hear the truth. Yeshua answered him, if I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. Therefore they said to him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him, whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately a rooster crowed. Now, again, that they do believe that was the Levite who was in charge of waking up the people because he was called in the Hebrew the equivalent of that word, rooster. Now, we know that Peter, like, we know that he then wept. We know that Peter was broken at that point. John doesn't have that, but let's keep going. Then they led Yeshua from Caiaphas to the Praetorium, and it was early morning, right? This makes sense with the rooster crowing, the cock crowing, because here's the Levite waking people up, and they're going, it's early morning now. He got arrested that night before the Passover. They did not eat the Passover dinner in the last meal, in the last supper. This book clearly says that. That was not the Passover meal. Now they've gone through the night, they arrested him, and now it's early morning. But they themselves did not, listen, listen, but they, the Jews, themselves did not go into the praetorium lest they should be defiled, but that they but that they might eat the Passover. Do you understand that? They didn't go into the praetorium because that night they were going to have to eat the Passover. And if they went in the praetorium, they thought they might become defiled because they had already purified themselves for the feast. Three days and three nights you purify yourselves for the feast of Passover. You're following me here. The Last Supper was not the Passover meal. The Last Supper was literally his Last Supper. He washed, it says that, it says it was before the Passover. Now before the Passover, at the dinner. He washed their feet. They go out to the garden. He's arrested. Now it's the morning and, and Peter has already denied him now. The, the Levite wakes everybody up and the Jews won't come in the praetorium because uh, if it would defile them, unless they, be, unless they be defiled, so they couldn't eat the Passover then that night, right? They needed to stay clean to eat the Passover. So Pilate then went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? So they would not go into the praetorium. So he, Pilate came out to them. They hadn't eaten the Passover yet. He answered and said to him, if he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. <laughs> like They're like, if he wasn't evil, we wouldn't have given him to you. And he's like, what did he do? Then Pilate said to them, you take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore, the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Yeshua might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Yeshua and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Yeshua answered him, are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have, what have you done? Yeshua answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Yeshua answered, you say rightly that I am a king, right? The kingdom of God, the ruler of the kingdom of God. For this cause I was born and for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. That's awesome. Pilate said to him, what's the truth? What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. But you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? 
Then they all cried again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. So then Pilate took Yeshua and scourged him. Oh, for us. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. Do not think you're going to be liked, popular, or treated well. This is the way our king, the leader of our kingdom that we follow, was treated. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault to him. Then Yeshua came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. They were mocking him. Ooh, when he comes back. Ooh, our king will be shown for who he was, who he is. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. And in verse 7 there, it actually doesn't say our law. It says the law. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid and went again into the praetorium and said to Yeshua, Where are you from? But Yeshua gave him no answer because he's like, Why are you, like, What's going on here? Please remember, this is before the Passover. This is the day of the 14th of Abib. That morning, he's being beaten. He has a crown. It might be 10 o'clock now. Who knows? Noon, maybe. He's being interrogated. They're saying, crucify him, crucify him. Then Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Yeshua answered, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. So false accusations, blasphemy. What's happening to us, guys? False accusations, blasphemy. If you follow Yeshua, you're going to be treated and despised like your Messiah. Right? You are going to be treated like your king. He says that a servant is not above his master. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Yeshua out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place which is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover. Again, this is the 14th day of Abib. They had not yet eaten the Passover. They were preparing to eat it. That's why the Jews we just saw, in we just saw, remember that verse, they wouldn't go in the praetorium, verse 28 of chapter 18, they wouldn't go into the praetorium because they couldn't eat the Passover that night then. They would have been defiled. So it was the preparation day of the Passover. I'm going to point out once again, this contradicts the book of Matthew and Mark, but this is exactly according to the story of, in Exodus. This is exactly like Deuteronomy and anywhere else in Torah. This is the one that matches the timeline. Please remember that. Okay, now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, behold your king. But they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered him to, to them to be crucified. Then they took Yeshua and led him away. This is Messiah ben Yosef, Messiah ben son of Joseph, who was going to be the savior of his brothers. But he was rejected, despised, and basically cut off from his brothers. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. I'm not going to get into that. There's a lot of speculation where this was, what it meant. That's not important. What is important? Let's keep going. Where they crucified him. The preparation day of Passover. See, they ate the Passover at the end of the 14th day of Abib as the Feast of Unleavened Bread was beginning. They ate the Passover with the unleavened bread and bitter roots. You didn't eat the Passover at the beginning of the 14th day of Abib. You ate it at the end as that day was closing out. In Hebrew, it says, Bain Eravim. You ate the Passover between the evenings. Bain Eravim, between the evenings. Okay. Because, okay, anyways, so they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Yeshua in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross and the writing was Yeshua of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title for the place where Yeshua was crucified was near the city and it was, it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore, the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, don't write the king of the Jews, but he said, I'm the king of the Jews. He said, I am the king of the Jews. Oh, I'm sorry. I read that wrong. Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I'm the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Yeshua, took his garments and made four parts to each soldier a part and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. That's significant. That's significant. 
it links him to the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. If you look at the garment put upon the high priest. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, so it shall be that the scripture might be fulfilled. It says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. Now, there stood by the cross. This is at the end of the 14th. This is when they're starting to crucify the Passover lambs. Why did I say crucify? Sacrifice the Passover lambs. Yeshua is physically dying. Now, this was the preparation day for Passover. And right around now, they, as Yeshua is dying on this cross, they are preparing the Passover lambs in the temple. Do you understand the timeline? In the word for festival in Hebrew, it's the word moed or moedim. It's the appointed time. Yeshua literally had an appointment to die at Passover, rise on Feast of First Fruits. Yeshua didn't rise a day before Feast of First Fruits or a day after Feast of First Fruits. He rose on the day of Feast of First Fruits. The, Yeshua died at the exact time of his, moed, his appointment. He had an, a scheduled appointment. The word in Hebrew for moed means appointment. You go to Israel today, you have an appointment. He died at the exact time the Passover lambs were dying. Okay. Um, and so they're there, but over in the temple, the priests are starting to, um, exactly John over in the temple, they're starting to sacrifice Well, right outside of the temple where they would sacrifice the lambs, right? They're starting to get the lambs and the goat sacrificed for the Passover. Yeshua she was dying at that exact time. He did desire to eat that Passover. He didn't get to, he desired, he would have rather done that than die, but he knew he had to die. Okay. Now there stood by the cross of Yeshua, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Yeshua therefore saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And this is John. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. So he took care of her because it appears that Joseph had died. After this, Yeshua, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it into his mouth. So when Yeshua had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. He didn't mean that all is done. He has to come back the second time. What was finished was that hour. His life was finished. The first round was done. Well, not the first round, but his first coming to earth. It was done. Therefore, listen, because it was the preparation day, because it still wasn't yet the Sabbath, the sun hadn't set, that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This isn't the weekly Sabbath. This is talking about that first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is a Sabbath. They were supposed to keep it because you ate the Passover at the end of the 14th day as the 15th was beginning, the 15th of Abib. The 15th of the month of Abib is a high Sabbath called the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It is a rest, no work day. So here's Yeshua dying. Just a little bit of time here between the evenings, between these two. Like, let's put the between. I'll put my fingers. There's a between the evening. They got to get Yeshua's body off the grave as they're preparing the Passover to be eaten before the Sabbath. Do you see? Do you see? Do you see? This is beautiful stuff, but you can't get mistaken through the book of Matthew and Mark. And you can't say, I'm just going to believe Matthew and Mark when this is the book that aligns with Torah. <laughs> this is the one that matches Exodus. You can't just pick and choose that which doesn't match. Okay? Okay. Okay. So they get the body, shall not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high Sabbath. The reason it says high there, that's the word usually that's translated as chief or premier, because it's a yearly Sabbath, not a weekly Sabbath. It's a high Sabbath. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Yeshua and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water poured out. And that is a sign. They actually did that on the temple often on the altar a lot. They would pour wine and um, water together. And they didn't even understand that they were symbolizing the blood of Yeshua. And he who had seen has testified and his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe for these things were done that the scripture shall be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And, and that one comes from, I forgot to look beforehand, sorry, Zechariah. And another scripture says they shall look on him whom they pierced. And that one comes, okay, that was Zechariah, the first one was numbers talking about the passover lamb after because you couldn't break its bones after this joseph of arimathea being a disciple of jesus but secretly for fear of the jews asked pilate that he may take the body of yeshua and pilate gave him permission so he came and took the body of yeshua and nicodemus who at first came to yeshua by night also came bringing a mixture of myrrh that's symbolic that's a spice symbolic of death and aloes 
um, and again, anointing, um, soothing, um, a burial spices, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Yeshua and bound it in strips and linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had, had been yet laid. So there they laid Yeshua because of the Jews preparation day for the tomb was nearby. They hurried up and got him off the cross before the high Sabbath. Does this make sense to you all now? Does this make sense? So Tuesday night they had the dinner. They go out to the garden, and it says in the book of John, it was before the Passover. So if you, you're saying John's a liar, right? So one of these scripts is wrong. Either Matthew, Mark is wrong, or the book of John's wrong. But the book of John matches Exodus, which proves it's right. Okay, so Tuesday night, they're eating the supper. He washes their feet. They go out to the garden. He's arrested, betrayed by Judas. In the morning, they're in the praetorium. The Jews don't go into the praetorium, so they don't get defiled. Then he is crucified at the time. He's mocked and interrogated. And then he's crucified at the same time. They're killing the lambs right before the 15th of Abib. But they hurry up and get his body off the cross before the Feast of Unleavened Bread begins. And when the Feast of Unleavened Bread begins, hi, Sina, sweetie. When the Feast of Unleavened Bread begins, then they had his body on the cross. That was a Wednesday night what we call Wednesday night. And then he was in the grave, Wednesday night, Thursday day, Thursday night, Friday day, Friday night, Saturday day, Saturday night, sometime during the night, he rose from the dead. It does not say anywhere in scripture that exactly three nights and three days is the sign of Jonah. Everything in Hebrew is kind of, like even like the tribulation, it appears there's gonna be like six and two thirds years, not exactly seven. So some people say, oh, he had to rise exactly as the sun was setting. Baloney, he did it in, if he had risen as the sun was setting, right, you know, they would have seen. Like, he did this in mystery, and the first people who noticed it, like, as we read chapter 20, is they came to the grave in the morning. Like, he rose sometime during the night. Like, right? On the first day of the week. That was the Feast of First Fruits. Now, I'm not going to continue with chapter 20, because i got to get to the next place. I gotta, we've got to do Bible study. But... I think you understand. Now, do you see why the book of John is where I told you to stay? The book of John. Like when you now go read Exodus with the book of John, read the book of Deuteronomy with the book of John, and you're going to see that our Messiah fulfilled the prophecy. He is our Passover lamb. He died at the exact time the Passover lambs were being killed. He died at that exact time. He didn't mess up. He didn't do it an hour earlier, an hour later. He was fulfilled the prophecy of the Moedim of Passover. It's a beautiful story. Oh, I love it. Any quick questions? It's got to be quick because I have to get going. I got to go check my aminals. Aminals. Um, he re no, no. So he returned, sweetie. Yeah, he rose from the dead. Yes, he rose from the dead after Sabbath in the night sometime because it couldn't have been when they could have still seen him because they didn't know. You would have noticed the tune rolled away. But in during the night, he rose. And then when's your next teaching? Ooh, that's a good question, John. Let's, okay. Okay, guys. Help me out here. I do have a little bit of time this week. Do we want to do teachings Tuesday and Thursday this week or just Wednesday? <laughs> I don't know why I was doing the fingers. So I need a vote. Tuesday, Thursday teachings. Well, now Sunday, Sunday night, 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time on Zoom, we're doing the Hebrew lessons. Those of you who are following, join with. If you just want to, some, yeah. Awesome, Kenneth. Um, I'm rewatching this. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I was so tired. Um, Tuesday, okay, so Al Alex wants Tuesday, Thursday. Well, I, this week I think I can do Tuesday, Thursday. I can do two. Tristan wants Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday. I've got two votes for that. Um, Tuesday, Thursday. Okay, so what we'll do then, um, and I tried to do them. I was doing them on, fa on Instagram too, but I just got to pull that community over here because, okay, so, so okay, well, the um, 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time is what we do it, and um Okay, um, okay, and then, other thing, awesome, Nelly, I love you, you're so cute. Um, yeah, I think this week we do, um, and I th we, we're going through the book of Isaiah, and if you look at the last, all the videos are under my video section, so if it's alive, it might not be labeled always, but some of, I've been trying to lately, and so then you just, you go on the live under my videos, just on the section of videos, and you'll see Tuesday, Thursday. Okay, so we're going to do it Tuesday and Thursday, 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. We're going to continue the book of Isaiah. Last week was, this last Wednesday was amazing. Chapter 4 itself was like, ah, perfect. Um, okay, so we're going to do Tuesday, Thursday, and then tomorrow night, Hebrew. Um, now, that, yeah. Okay, I think we got it. I love you guys. Um, 
does any, so nobody has any questions. See, doesn't the book of John help you understand so clearly? Doesn't that help you understand? Because even the book of Matthew you can be reading, it's like, oh, they did the Passover here and then again. The book, the translators in Matthew, I'm not saying the book is bad. I'm saying there's some things where the translators got confused. Um, well, and here's the coolest thing. Yeah, we bless you. But Emery, look at this. All I do is read it. Now, I've read the Bible probably thousands of times. Okay, so it does help to be able to put the things together. But I always tell you guys, slow down and read it. Read it. Now, some of you, if you don't know the story of the two houses of Israel or you don't understand scripture, I get it. It's going to maybe take a few times. But you can do it. Okay. Um, I'm so fa happy I found you. Guys, you can message me. I'm a little bad today about getting back to any messages because i got to hurry up, go feed animals, feed this animal, and then get into town. Um, yes, we need to be born again this side. Okay, love you guys. Love you. I'm so thankful for you all. Tuesday night, 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time here and Thursday. Pray. I, I went up to Dan again this morning. That is, there's false accusers. So let's pray for deliverance. Pray that Yahweh always makes a way for these teachings to keep coming through. Um, and we see that he Messiah and the disciples are persecuted. We're going to be persecuted. You're going to be persecuted. Be that Lazarus. Rise from the dead. If you miss the beginning of this, you need to go back. Start. 12 minutes after we started. I think it was, actually it was 14 minutes. That's where the teaching begins. Thank you guys. Thank you, Danielle, for always posting that. Thank you, Angela. Thank you guys. Thank you, Jesse. Love you guys. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, I'm going to go in and see Kimberly and Austin and Morgan and Judd and Catherine and Trey and Heather and Everly and Mark and Debbie. So I love you guys. I'm so blessed to have a local fellowship here. I think y'all should just move up here. Love you guys. Yes, I know. Sorry, I was crying earlier, Chris. So you're right. Yeah, go feed the animals. I know. 